not jump into it tonight because I'm kind of wary. <laughs> but to God be glory, 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 and all our praise. It's an awesome day, it's been an awesome day, it's been an awesome day, it's been an awesome day, the presence of God. Where else would you want to be tonight than to be in the presence of God? In the presence of God, there's fullness of joy. Oh, my, my, my. Hallelujah. Father, in the name of Jesus, I bless you. I glorify you. I exalt you. Hallelujah. I bless you, oh God. I glorify you. I magnify you. For we have been spending time before you, oh God, throughout this week, oh God. Some of us have been coming every night, oh God. We thank you for strengthening those that have been coming on fasting. We thank you, oh God, for those that have been coming on a Friday. And oh God, oh God, even on a Saturday and a night, we just give you praise. In this time of prayer and fasting, we glorify you, we exalt you. We magnify you because you are great and awesome, God. And so, Lord God, I thank you right now. I praise you for this word. I ask, oh God, that you will speak to the hearts of your people. And I give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor. I want to thank Pastor Ora for giving me this opportunity to stand behind this pulpit and to minister this word. Saw the flame of desire into fervency. Oh, my, my, my. I had a book. I was thinking I'm so busy. I had a book I wanted to read about a fire to read something I want to have read it out of the wind of the wind of fire. And I don't get it. But this is taken from Matthew. And what I love about this one. I look at this text and I think that's just a half an hour. If this message is more than a half an hour, but I'm going to be obedient to the Spirit of God and to the man of God in this house and his wife who allow me to stand behind this pulpit. I like to be obedient. And obedience is better than sacrifice. And if a lot of us do that, God will do awesomeness in our life. And in church. And when he talk about the story, the frame of desire into fervency, and it goes by in the report and the paper compass, like when we saw on my computer. But this guy talk about his name is M L Means, M E A N S. All I know is the last name. If I go to the on my computer and I jump and I know where to find it. And this is the only one that he wrote. And when I look at the text. I don't see nothing else from him. But he, the point of it, I, I label my message about the talent because he's talking about the talent. In Matthew 25, Jesus talked about, he said about the talent. And let me read, I want to read a little bit of it from my Bible. I'm reading from the New International Bible. In Matthew chapter 25, and it started at verse 14, but I'm not going to read all of that. Again, I will be like a man going on a journey, who called his servant and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talent of money, to another two talent, and to another one talent, each according to the, his ability. You hear what he said? Each according to their ability. That means pastor oral ability is more than Sister uh, I tell now. Sister Tumble, Pastor Tumble ability is more than Brother Godfrey. So you got a little bit more. You got less. He didn't give it because he wanted to give it, but he gave it according to the ability. This is what the New International is saying. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received the five talents went at once and put his money to work to gain five more. The parable, this parable went on to tell, taking information from my other, from the full life Bible. It's like a warning us that our place and service in heaven will depend on the fullness of our life and service. It's, this talent is about our life. It's talking about what our service here on this earth, how it's going to depend on the faithfulness of our life and our heavenly service.
Let's look at what happened in verse 15. When the man went on this journey, when he gave him the money, I now ask you all a question. What is the value of a talent? Who could answer that? What is the value of a talent? I want to answer. The value of a talent. The biblical talent, that's what it comes about. The scripture is talking about the talent of what Jesus spoke about here. What is the value of it? Okay. The wages, no pastor. The Bible tells me, the my poor life Bible, it is value a whole lot of money. I don't want to really give it. I want to give it away. I want somebody to tell me. Okay, let me ask you this question. Is it $500? Is it $800? Is it $1,000? Is it more than $1,000? Thank you, Pastor. More than what? Right, it's more than $1,000. <laughs> I was struck when I started to read and I study. I'm sorry, I went and I grabbed another Bible. And drop grab one from there. But I'm looking in all of these Bibles. A talent had value in those days more than a thousand dollars. Somebody reach somebody I told you enough today. And when I look at that, I say, wow, more than a thousand dollars. So you imagine this guy got five talents. He invested his five, and he got five more. So when he gave his boss back his own, he had $10,000. The one that had two, had $2,000. And the one that had one foolish guy, put it in the ground, and it came with interest. Those who received the money, invested their money. A talent present our abilities, time, resources, and opportunity to solve or urge. It is something to help us account to the word of God to help us to serve here or not. This is what the talent is considered about in this in this lesson this guy was speaking out. Deep in the heart of every Christian, there's a call from the Holy Spirit. There's a call. See, this man, he wanted to see what these guys was really going to do. You have to desire for God to be like a talent. We have to have that desire to be like a talent. What your talent is going to do, you're going to invest your spiritual life in the things of God. Each of us has to be given a measure of desire. If we take that desire to an exchanger, it will exchange. I'm sorry, it will increase. Who can we take it to? The only... <laughs> We can only take this exchange, he said, to the desire of our God. And he will make that exchange for us because it's our desire to go higher. Things like praying, fasting, studying, praising, and worshiping, worship will always increase our desire for God. And the more we do that, the stronger our desire will get. So that's our talent. Our talent taken to God, it's going to increase. It's going to increase just like the talent would increase in the bank. You know, I've been praying and I think I'll give me more wisdom, give me more wisdom. You don't have to be careful. Like, oh, you have to be careful when you ask God, you know. Be careful when you tell God. I always hope that, okay, I'm not going to be careful when I say to God. And I said, I think we prepare them for Friday. We can't be careful what we say to God. That God was here, you know. And when you think that he's not <laughs> coming back on you, I say, oh, do you say that? So why did you say that if you're not going to do it? So we have to be very careful. Our challenge will work for us. Deep in the heart of every Christian, there's a call of holiness to rise up. And when we go to the book of Solomon, I love Solomon, you know, a lot of people don't read it in church today. I like it. I did it when I got my anniversary some time back. The book of Solomon talk about love, okay? And also people maybe don't like to read it. Solomon chapter 2, verse 10 and 13, verse 10 to 13 said, My lover spoke and said to me, Arise, my darling, my beautiful one, and come with me. Now this is what the guy put in this thing. Okay, talking about the challenge, you know. 
See, the winter is past. The rain are over and gone. Flowers appear on the earth. The season of singing has come. The cooling of dove, the hooing of the dove. You know the dove that the hoo when they when they made him. And tearing in our land. The fig trees form the earth fruits. The blossoming vines spread their fragrance. Arise, come, my darling, my beautiful one, come with me. He was really talking about the passion of sexual. He was talking about rising to do. He said, with this call is the promise of spring, the busting forth of flowers, the singing of the birds, the promise of revival. That's what he was talking about. So he tended to arise. We were talking about praying here about revival for the past night and up to Friday. If we will arise from where we are and run after who him, we can run after God. It isn't always easy, but the results are excellent. It's not always easy, but the result is excellent. When we run after him to arise, he said, my darling, my darling, arise and run. Run to who? Run to Jesus. When we run to him, if, our Christian, if the Christian today and God Christian will arise with this call of promise, God will do great things in this land. He went on to talk about the hunger principle. He said, I found the key that has really helped me. You know, like a change of the key. You keep jumping the this thing with Pastor Stanley to make it really good. The hunger principle. Here you're eating food every day. Now we eat today. But you eat too because you were hungry and you were satisfied. Some get because they were hungry, they had a little soup. It is in the natural, the more you eat, the less hungry you feel. No matter how hungry you are, when you sit down to eat, as you eat, your hunger fades away. But in the spirit, in the spiritual, it's just opposite. The more you pray, you know you're hungry for what? The things of God. So the more you pray, the more hungry you become. This also means that the less you pray, the less you become hungry. And I took some principles like this. I said, one, I found when you talk about the key. In the natural, the more you eat, the less you become hungry. After you sit down to eat, the hunger fades away. But in the spiritual, you are just the opposite. Why? The more you pray, the more hungry you get for him, for who? Him, for Jesus Christ. Number four, it also means the less you pray, is the less hungry you become. You don't want to be praying because, oh God, I feel like praying today. I'm gonna pray when I come home from work. And you don't go near the prayer, you don't go near the Bible, you don't say one word. Why? There is a spiritual law in this. You have to be hungry for more of God, for revival to break out in you and then those around you. When you become hungry for God, revival must start in you first of all. It's not going to start no places but in you. And when you get so hungry for this, for this, this change and revival, you're going to see the flame, the flame will burst out. It's not going to stir up unless you have a desire to be hungry. That flame of fire inside of you is going to be stirred up when you get so hungry for God. If you're not hungry, the fervency of the desire of God will not cause the flame to go out. You've got to be hungry. If you're not hungry, the fervency is not going to come. You have to have that desire to cause the flame to really go out. So if you don't do it, there goes the fire. You know when? You know when you catch up with you, and then fire, and you know, they don't keep putting coal on it, and burn it, what happened? It starts to go down, and now you have to make ashes, bear this thing, and then flame in there. And what you have to do, throw, throw the, uh, move the ashes, put some more coal on it, throw some wind on it, and see it, and blaze up again. That's how you have to be in your spiritual life. You have to be like, Oh, hallelujah. Oh, Jesus. Hallelujah. 
glory to God. You have to have a deeper desire. You want to go higher with God. You have to have a fire. You got to put coal on it. You got to put a coal on it. You don't have to put nothing to ignite it. You just have to keep on putting on the coal. And that little flame will just rise up. And it will take part in the name of Jesus. Without realizing it, you become like lukewarm cities existing and revival die within you. We don't want a revival to die within us. We don't want it to die. We want this revival to keep on blossoming. it. And in order for this revival to keep on moving in us, we need to rekindle the fire. We've got to rekindle this fire. We must put some more coal on it. We must put some coal on it. The guy went on to say, they are placed by God. And he talked about one of my men, he talked about one of my mentor in this Bible. Moses has always been my mentor in the world of God. Mm. I always tell God, you know, be like Moses, you know, the years that you have given Moses. I'm going to be like that. I'm going to preach this, that. I'm going to go to the nation and do what you want me to do. But you got to keep me like Moses. So I'm believing God for it. Exodus 33 said in verse 21 said, Then the Lord said, There is a place near me where you may stand on the rock. The guy was talking about the place he had found in the wilderness. Moses went up, was up to his neck with problem. He had so much problem with the people when he bring out of Egypt. They're still thinking and the garlic and the, the meat and the ham and the uh, the steak and all of that stuff and the ribs and all of that and the baked potato and the baked macaroni. You know, he was thinking of all of these things. They start thinking, so Moses was up to his neck with these people. <laughs> yes. So you got to put on the S on the thing to the message you before. And during this time, he said, the multitude were hard-headed people. The guy, let's go back and move. He called them hard-headed people. He said, go, and Moses called them hard-headed. They were hard-headed people. He thought Moses do something wrong that God him, but he was such a man that God had such a relationship with Moses. He when he said, do this, he strike the rock instead of doing what he said to do. But these rebellious people, Moses finally realized this job was too big for him. So he began to cry to God for help. And God responded. And God said to him, Moses, there's a place by me. There's a place by me. There's a place by me. You can come up and stand on the rock. Moses, to get to the place, he had to go uphill. It was difficult. But he found a way to get there. When Moses got there, what an encounter he had with God. God told, kept him, because if God did not keep Moses in the cleft of the rock and cover him, he would have died. Because nobody could see God and live. So Moses was there in the cleft of the rock. And the verse 22 said, When my glory passed by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Give me some big hands eh? What big hands of God have? That he put Moses in the cleft of the rock and he said, I'm going to cover you there so when my glory just usher by. And when the glory went by, here come the book of Genesis. Here come the book of Israel. And he began to give him the books. He began to have in his belly the thing that he wanted to write. Moses wasn't there in the beginning, but he began to write the book. The Genesis. When Moses came down, what a different encounter. When he came from upstairs with Jesus, his face shines so with so much glory of God that the people run away from his presence. Moses had a new power with God now. Brethren, that same place that Moses had with God, it is open for us today. The same voice is calling us today. I have, the guy went on to say, he, I have found this place where I am telling you about myself. It's a 
place close to God as before. At times, some of us feel like we are drifting away. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Like for instance, sometimes you sometimes we come here and that's all right. Thank you, hundred people for being here today. Thank you, 500, 5,000 for being here for the start of assembly. That is what I will say. Because that's what I want to see. And that, see, if I keep calling it, it's going to be so. When I walk in to do ministry, I say, thank you, 100 women for being here. If there's only 20 women, I consider them 100. And my thing is not to be discouraged because they didn't come. Who God wanted to hear, what the person has to hear, will hear it. And who wanted to grow him, some of them, is him. So, you know, you just want to be admonished. So 5,000, God bless your heart. Praise the Lord. So we're going to restore up the fire, the flame, and we're going to fan it. We're going to put more coal on it so it, it, they can keep on rumbo So they, Jesus, so they can keep on being stirred up to do what God wanted to do in this time and in this season. He said, a place there by God is the same place for us today. It is open for us. And I said, the same voice is calling. <laughs> I'm not going to read it, but go to Jeremiah 29, 13. Read it for the word. Jeremiah 29, 13. Hebrews 11, 6. And the guy went on to say, I came to a place in my life where I realized that everything even slowly, my relationship with the Lord has been eroding. You ever feel like your relationship with God has been going not at the way you wanted to do, but you have that fast? It's not on a fast track anymore. It's on a slow track. And he said, I still had a pretty good prayer, but it was not lasting not enough for fervency. He said, I stopped hiding myself behind excuses. And admit that I had to come to the place of leveling up and letting up on my quest for God. You have to be on a quest. And a quest for God. You know, the scientists go on a quest to do different scientists. We have to go on a quest for God. We got to search out even in one word. What a word of worship. Don't come on and worship. You let us take it and just break it down and just do it. And see what it is about doing it. And that's a quest. You're going in a quest now. I'm going to I'm back to the wisdom, the wisdom of God, and to find out what all about the wisdom of God to find out what it is. So we have to do that. Isaiah 64 or 7 homework. James 5, 16 to 18. Read them. All we talk about a place with God. And I'm coming to a cool close. Stirring ourselves up. Stirring our stuff up. God dealt with me, he said, and I was shocked that I was becoming one of those God who, who turned his face from. He said he felt like God had turned his face from me. And sometimes when we disobey him, God turned his face from us. But he said, love us. And he said, once he enjoyed a very close walk with God the Lord, and although I still knew him, he said, I wasn't close anymore. Have you been there? I felt myself almost like, okay, Lord, I'm not going to get in a pity party. Sometimes people don't shop, people don't do that. But I'm going to still do what you call me to do. I'm going to still do what you call me to do. It doesn't matter whether it's two or three, but the brother that the way two or three are gathering his name, you know, what he's there, brother. You know, we're two or three together. We are here in the midst. And 5,000, we are more than we are more than two or three here in the midst of the 5,000. We're in the midst of the 5,000, you know. You are in the midst of the 5,000. See yourself in the midst of the 5,000. Don't forget it. See yourself in the midst of the 5,000 and rejoice. He said, God, to wake me up in the night. He asked God, wake him up in the night. It was easier for him to wake up in the night. You ever feel this? I can't sleep around 12 o'clock in the night. I'm like, when I just I'm praying, I'm coming up my bed and I pray, pray, pray. Like, my God, it's only 3, 3 o'clock in the morning. Now, when time comes for prayer, I can't sleep, wake up to go and pray. <laughs> but you see, that's what God will do because you have to 
There's a reason for you being there in that place. Oh, to pray for somebody. I have wake up and pray for people committing to it. I don't know who they is, but God knows the stopping somebody from being destroying their life. But just pray. So he had God to wake him up, he said. And I really enjoy resting my tired bones, he said, in it. By doing that, he was resting in God. And his tired bones, all his bones, tired bones, was resting in the things of God. So God was waking him up 2 a.m. in the morning. And it was getting excited. So you will get excited with the things of God. I pray that God don't have to start me laughing in my bed because I'm a half of the top of the <laughs> Sometimes I get up out and then I go in another room and I want to pray. Because I know me. I'm going to get carried away like that. I mean, my husband used to tell me, tell him, so I don't need to be praying. He said, put you up there. Put you up. <laughs> but you've got to stir up this yourself. The Holy Spirit is the eye of God. And those eyes are running to and fro throughout the whole earth. Like a giant short night. Looking for hungry people. Are you hungry tonight? Are you hungry for God? Are you want the flame to be burning up and um, you know raising up and pooping up and um, blowing up when you see when you see that red flame come and it start to catch or uh, like a house on fire? You see how the smoke go up? We want to be like that. That's the kind of fire God wanted. Uh, that's the kind of fire God wanted Global Life Church. When God started this house, it started with prayer. There's a kind of fire, a kind of prayer we to come here. Also, I, but then I hear this occasion of talking about just a little bit and all of them. And I, I tend to like to you know, so much about being here, but it used to be good when we come here early in the morning and get our prayer set up. I have a book that says, Don't just sit there, do something. Don't just sit there, do something. It was given to me by Leone. But that's what God wants us to do. Nothing will change our life as long as we are content to stay where we are. If you're content to stay right there and you don't want to move on, it's okay for you. Stay right there. We must realize we are caught in a trap and will stay there until like blind but Thomas. He cried out for God to help him. You know, he was in one spot, but he cried out for help. What he bring, what he bring us out of exciting, but what we will be bringing out is more exciting. When we get into more of it, it'll be more exciting. When we get into the things of God, and my friends, stir up the fire within you, stir it up. Be like Elijah when he tell the king to run. He said, "Go." He tell Ahab, "Go up, eat and drink." He said, "Go up and eat and drink." No, you like your cutting with white house. Where you were telling go up and eat and drink? There was no rain in the place for three years. And he told him to go up eat and drink. Because now he's going to go up to pray. He went up to pray. Put his head between his legs. That's a great example for us. And when he prayed, he sent his servant to look and he said, Go look. And he said, I see nothing. And the seventh time, when he looked, he said, I see the clouds rising up from the sea like the hands of a man's face. And he tell Ahab, and Ahab, you better run, get a chariot ready and go. But look at it, Elijah brought the chariot and went to him. God, God answered prayer. The same God, why he asked to stop the rain from falling, the same God what manifests himself again. So you see, I do not want my fire to go with God. He has done great things for me, and my relationship with him is so important. He is my father. I am the clay. He is the potter. And sometimes we need to be reshaped. So you have to stir the flame of desire into fervency for you again. God bless you. Good, good word. Amen. <laughs>